say that, but I, I believe what I've said so often, that, that the people uh, let you know whether you should or not. And uh, I just resisted to allowing myself to think about it uh, too early. I think campaigns are too long anyway. And uh, I just waited as things went on and the rule would have to be done here in the job and finally came to a decision that the well, the funny thing is, both of us felt pretty much the same way. Both several times when the thing would come up in talk or articles or conversation or anything, and uh, or something like, uh, should we let this organizational effort go forward even without my being an announced candidate? And uh, but we both had this, the attitude of saying uh, that uh, there would come a time when we would. Uh, when we'd sit down and talk about it. And then uh, there did come a time when we sat down one night. When did you do it? When did you sit down? Oh, not too long ago. It was, uh, I'd have to say it was this fall. And uh, there wasn't any disagreement about it. We both had the feeling that it should be done. And most people are saying this is going to be a close election. Whoever the nominee is for the Democrats is going to be a close election. You're an old political pro. Honestly, could you lose this election? Yes, I, I happen to be someone who would. I've never done this in all the times I've done it without feeling I'm one vote behind. What one either perception or issue or question or political concern have you at the moment? That one thing. Yes, and suppose that we, we rigged our programs and our tax breaks and so forth for the, for the rich and for, for business. These are absolute falsehoods. Anyone who looks at it, I defy them to go back a long way in some of the tax relief programs, such as Kennedy's tax cut program in the 60s. And you will find that there were more benefits for the top five brackets, the income taxpayers, and for business in those bills than there were in ours. Mr. President, there are people across this country, the truly need, the down and out, the poor, who look at you and they say, yeah, he is the nicest man and we like him, but his policies are causing misery, they're hurting us, we're hungry, and, and they don't understand. They say, if he cares that much, why are we hurting? What do you say to them? Dave, I tell you, what I would like to be able to say to them, have a chance to say to them is that, sure, when someone is having his, down in his luck, it's having hard times, 
and they'd like to have someone to blame, they have heard a steady drumbeat that we are to blame and what we're doing with the budget. Now, let me just point something out back when I was governor. And we conducted the most comprehensive welfare reforms that have ever been performed in this country. We saved, at the state level, it doesn't sound so big at the federal level, but we saved some $2 billion in California for the taxpayers with our reforms. And yet, at the same time, we're able to increase the grants for the truly needy people on welfare by 43%. And they have not had an increase in their grants since 1958. And I'm not talking about in the 1970s that our reforms took place. Now, they've been told over and over again that because we're trying to hold down government spending, that somehow we're taking it out of their hides. We are spending more on food for the hungry, more on the needy, more on, on the uh, health care that has ever been spent in the history of this country. But what is difficult to explain to them is that food, uh, we've uh, supported that and we've advocated and helped and have a, an office right here in the White House to tell people the community level what other people have found out they can do in other communities. Yes, that is a, a worthwhile thing, probably we're unique in this country, we're the only country uh, where they start to do this. Uh, just the other day we saw a family on television in the news, wiped out before Christmas, all their gifts and their home and everything else. And a few days later in the news, we saw where people from all over the United States, just on their own, were sending money, and craftsmen and workers were coming from all over the country to help rebuild their house free. That's great. If that would happen, that every person who is that piece. The meetings in Geneva, the meetings with people who've been shooting at each other for the last 14 years, coming together, the attempts on the part of President Jemima to broaden the base of his government and take in these dissident groups of, of Lebanese. All of this was offering a promise of success. And the radicals, and backed by Syria, who don't want success, who don't want peace in Lebanon except on their terms, they are trying to, trying to drive the multinational force out because then they can have their way. And Dave, if that happens, if we would yield to terrorism and say, well, we're just going to get out, the terrorists of the world know that then all they have to do is perform their vicious acts, and they can control the conduct of even great nations. Worse than that, it would mean the end of any possibility of long-term peace in the whole Middle East. And it would probably lead to war between Syria and Israel. And I don't think there could be any government of the United States that would ever stand by and see the state of Israel destroyed. Let me move to the Soviet Union. And you have said for a long time, the only way to negotiate arms reduction is to do something. We have refurbished the military to a point where we, we haven't completely caught up with the great buildup of the Soviets, but we've caught up enough. Previous to this, you sit down with any negotiation with the Soviets, and an administration says, we're going to cancel this weapon system. We're not going to build this bomber not going to build this other program. They didn't have to give us anything in the line of disarmament. I campaigned saying, no more of these limitation treaties like SALT, where you went and what you tried to set was a ceiling on how fast you would add additional weapons. I said, let's have negotiations where we try to reduce the number we presently have on both sides. Would you make concessions to get the Soviets back to the negotiating table? We have been more flexible they are the ones who have been adamant. They have not come back when we meet some terms of theirs and say, all right, let's negotiate on this. They have nothing to offer. Now, you're, we're you're saying, saying, no, we won't make further concessions to no, get them back to negotiate. No, we're saying we'll be able to take, come on back. They made a statement of the start talks. They made one statement about something of, uh, well, they were willing to discuss a certain number of missiles, a certain number of planes, a certain number of uh, missiles and submarines. And we've said, oh, 
we're, we're ready to talk on that. We'd like to then throw in some limitations on the number of warheads, total warheads, because each missile carries more than one warhead. They haven't come back. They're waging a propaganda campaign to try and scare our European allies into repudiating their request for the intermediate range missiles. Remember, we didn't start the Pershings and the cruise missiles for the NATO countries. They asked for that in 1979. They asked, and it was decided to the previous administration that we would provide those weapons they'd asked for. And we're doing it. Deficits. Most people of Congress under the Constitution which spends money. There is not one word in the Constitution that gives the president the right to spend money. I don't have, I don't have control of that budget. They determine that. Now, the deficit has never been raised by them as a problem in all these years. But many of us, for 25 years, I've been making speeches that we cannot go on with deficit spending. And for most of those 40 years, the Democrats told us Deficit spending was all right. We owed it to ourselves. Then right now, why not let it? Right now. Yeah. Right now, we're <laughs> The cuts in spending that I have asked for, and that's all I can do is ask and try to pressure them into my public relations. Let me tell you, would be $40 billion at the present deficit right now if they had given me the spending cuts I asked for in 1981. <laughs> Okay, so then I'll do my camera. 